Hello, hello, welcome to 1338. And Hans will present a lecture about an article written by Terence W. Deacon. And Terence W. Deacon, his, his research is about human evolutionary biology and neuroscience. And he is at Berkeley. And this article is co-written by Turon Cashman. And the name of the article is Steps to a Metaphysic of Incompleteness. And I will uh, only give this very short, so I ask uh, Hans uh, to speak about this. Professor Berkeley. Thank you very much, Kalle, to introduce him. Terence Deacon. And I will read the article now. And I'm at page 410. And before I just mention the masters in empiricism, David Hume and G. E. Moore. And Terence is showing another path, quite a marvelous direction. Biology occupies a sort of middle ground in uh, which it is possible to take either stance thus cellular and molecular research can provide detailed studies of the operation of molecular machines. Whereas organismic and evolutionary biologists can analyze the many levels of adaption by which organisms maintain, maintain themselves in order to persist long enough to reproduce. Nevertheless, when pressed most biologists turn to the neutral terminology of teleonomy to describe apparent and directed behavior. and assume that teleological processes were shown to be irrelevant for evolution. One of the most illustrious interactionists of the 20th century was the Nobel Prize winning neurophysiologist Sir John Eccles. In a book length dialogue with Karl Popper he argued that the left cerebral hemisphere of the human brain contains structures that collectively he called the liaison brain.
the liaison brain was claimed to provide a link between a disembodied mind and its physical brain. Ultimately, this just replaces the pineal body in Descartes' speculation with a different set of brain structures. But provides no greater insights concerning how they could be affected by a disembodied self. Probably the most popular modern version of interactionism, however, derives from an effort to explain consciousness using quantum theory. in what is currently the most influential quantum theory of consciousness. Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose argue that the differential modifications of microtubule formations in different regions within each neuron and distributed in the hundreds of millions of neurons throughout the cerebral cortex could be influenced by quantum level coherence effects. Quantum theoretic approaches to consciousness also hint at a modern resolution of interactionists' metaphysics with what is often termed dual aspect theory. Variations on this theme were, were articulated during the first half of the 20th century by philosophers such as William James and Alfred North Whitehead. And have many modern proponents. Dual aspect theory 
offered an apparent resolution of interactionist difficulties by positing that all phenomena include both a subjective and objective interior and exterior mental and mechanistic genetic and morphological aspect Quantum phenomena provide a novel way to reframe these approaches. This is because quantum theory posits a necessary transition between two mutually exclusive but interdependent causal domains. the quantum and the classical. Quantum strangeness characterized by the superposition of mutually exclusive states and the existence of entangled states violates simple spatio-temporal localization. So by definition, it cannot be identified with the mechanistic domain that Descartes called res extensa by default then these non-extended characteristics place quantum phenomena within Descartes realm of res cogitans Since the fundamental purpose of quantum mechanics is to describe precisely how interacting quantum phenomena give rise to the classical mechanistic properties exhibited by microscopic material and energetic phenomena. The discipline appears to provide a parallel to the account of res cogitans influencing res extensa.
while at the same time treating these as merely different levels of one physical reality. Though it is seldom acknowledged, this resonance with a logic of Cartesian dualism almost certainly contributes to the intuition that consciousness might have a quantum explanation. The problem with this superficial parallelism is that the quantum properties that violates the excluded middle restrictions of classical mechanics do not actually correspond to the properties that Descartes identified with the realm of Rescovitans. Specifically, mental and experiential phenomena. Quantum indeterminacy may be relevant to addressing the classical dilemma posed by the presumed incompatibility between determinism and free will. Recent findings from the theory of dynamical chaos have demonstrated that highly divergent consequences can result from nearly identical initial conditions. The ultimately indeterminate fluctuations that characterize subatomic events could, that, could thus potentially be amplified in this way. Such as by chaotic neural dynamics to produce highly unpredictable causal trajectories.
However, these quantum properties provide no account of the teleological and experiential features that were the basis for Descartes' distinction. So, although to account for the character of quantum phenomena, is itself an important challenge for any modern metaphysics. The quantum classical relation offers no new clues to the metaphysical status of living and mental teleology. This likely explains why many quantum consciousness theorists have turned to panpsychism to account for this property. So, in summary, since the Renaissance, the natural sciences have tacitly assumed what can be described as a machine metaphysics. And yet, the undeniable teleological nature of human experience and conscious agency has resulted in a sort of methodological dualism in which we both must use teleological terminology while at the same time denying the ontological status of teleological phenomena. But this leaves us with an untenable metaphysical gulf that suggests that the most fundamental attribute of our existence is in some sense unreal. As the father of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, Ilya Prigogin lamented, we must understand our world in such a way that it will not be absurd to claim that it has produced us.
if we are to find a way to redeem science so that it explains rather than pretending to explain away the reality of lives and minds and the subjectivities and values that indubitably exist, we need to dissolve this dilemma. From Cretan to Girdle, section 2. One of the most profound and unexpected discoveries of modern logic and mathematics was Kurt Gödel's proof that a formal system can be either internally consistent or complete but not both. In many respects, it represents an awakening out of the Enlightenment dream. This discovery was essentially the culminating development of the exploration of paradoxical relationships that began with the discovery of the Cretan Lias paradox in ancient Greece. Though told in different ways, the basic logic begins with the assumption that all Cretans are liars. So if a Cretan says, I am lying, he can't be lying. which means he is telling the truth that he is lying. But since he is a Cretan, he must be lying about this, and so on. A simpler version is the statement, this statement is false. If the statement is true, then it is false. But if it's false, then it's true, and so on. Other more involved variants of self-undermining relationships have also been described over the years. A 
A famous example is a book with pages that each contain lists of some of the page numbers in that same book. There will be pages where the list of page numbers includes the number of the page that the list occurs on and pages with lists that don't include the number of that page. There can even be a page with all the page numbers of pages that also contain their own page number. But there can't be a page with a list of all and only the page numbers of pages in the book that don't include their own page number in the list. <coughs> if that page doesn't list its own page numbers, then its list is incomplete. But if it, but if it does, then it's not a page with a list of all and only the page numbers of pages in the book that don't include their own page number. This analogy is probably closest to the logic of Gödel's proof. Since the task is either incomplete or results in an error, inconsistency as described below. At the beginning of the 20th century, the philosopher Bertrand Russell identified an analog analogous paradox at the heart of set theory and predicate logic. It is often characterized as the class of all classes that are not member of themselves. As with the book analogy, if it is a member of itself, it cannot be, but it, it, if it isn't, then it must be, and so on. Russell reason that one might evade this problem by simply prohibiting this sort of confusion of logical levels, which he defined as logical types. With this provision, he and Alfred, Alfred North Whitehead produced a seemingly complete 
logical mathematical formal system the principia mathematica 1910 to 1913 enter Kurt Gödel by devising an ingenious way of mapping formulas one to one onto a set of numbers analogous to the page of page numbers example he showed that such a mapping can be used to produce an unresolvable formula that can na neither be proved or disproved within that formal system. Like the book of page numbers, the entire formal system of Principia Mathematica or any similar formal system must either be unable to avoid inconsistencies or be incomplete. The mathematician computer scientist Douglas Hofstadter has made a career long study of this sort of relationship, beginning with his award winning book Gödel Escher Bach. He describes such relationships as strange loops because of their intrinsically self-undermining nature. A number of commentators, including the philosopher logician George Spencer Brown and the anthropologist system systems theorist Gregory Bateson, refrain the liar's paradox dilemma as it might apply to real world phenomena. Instead of being stymied by the undecidability of the logic they focused on the very process of ana analyzing these relationships the reason these are undecidable is that each time they are interpreted it changes the context in which they must be 
interpreted. And so one must inevitably alternate between, the, between true and false. Included and excluded, consistent and inconsistent, etc. So, although there is no fixed logical, thus synchronic status of the matter, the process of following these implicit injunctions results in a predictable pattern across time. In logic, the statement, if true then false, is a contradiction. In space and time, if on, then off, is an oscillation. Gregory Bateson likened this to the simple electric buzzer, such as the bell in the old ringer telephones. The basic design shown in figure 3, depicted in the paper, involves a circuit that includes an electromagnet that, when supplied with current, attracts a metal bar that pulls it away from an electric contact. This breaks the circuit, cutting off the electricity to the electromagnet, which allows the metal bar to spring back into position, where the electric contact recloses the circuit, re-energizing the electromagnet, and so on. The resulting on-off, on-off activity is what produces a buzzing sound. Or if attached to a small mallet, can repeatedly ring a bell. The critical insight provided in this physical framing of the paradox is that its logic requires, even generates, time. When physically realized, its essential features make no sense without understanding the system's disposition to be in a different state at each future moment. Following Charles Sanders Peirce's conception of causality based on fundamental continuity, a concept he called cynicism, we can thus say that this disposition to continue in this way 
exhibits a habit that has a mode of being in futuro. In other words, it cannot be fully described in synchronic or at temporal terms. Indeed, at any instant, its present state is in the process of absenting its current condition. We argue that this is loosely parallel to the condition of being alive. except that instead of merely being organized to produce a future change of state, a living organism is organized to respond to the potential absenting of its own existence. I put a stop there and looking through these pages they are looking at the important absent, the absentee of existence, but also the absence of doings. When he mentions in futuro, it equals exactly the electrical circuit being closed and thereby stopping the opening. The opposite obviously applies. Usually we get fixated with one state over the other and we forget that they have absolute codependence. A very good picture for that is a chessboard taking away the black squares of course, we take away the chessboard, but the very same thing happens if you take away the white ones. They are complementary codependent. In action is obviously and clearly dependent on action. In a way, that is similar to ordinary life. We have work and we have rest. We have an awake state and we have a sleeping state. And a living organism is characterized even more of this being present and this being absent. Look at a thought, a conscious thought. That is present, but when it ends, what happened to the consciousness? Isn't this the, the dilemma that Descartes presented for himself? Deacon shows that actually this is to be alive. And I would say to have an intention, because if you don't have the absence of the, so to speak, unreal future, 
you will have no action potential but also your now will be gone the energy will be lost and the reality of things they become shimmering non-reachable thoughts and I think this is very similar to when uh, you caught off guard and somebody asks you and you say I have it on the tip of my tongue this is ordinary way of being this is thus man this is the Newtonian paradigm where we can't reach our thought we cannot think in a reachable way the thoughts are constantly escaping us there and not there and this is something that can be healed by understanding this is the good part this is what makes up reality it is made of absence and existence and it yields in that way for presence I've been thinking about this this could be why we today have lost the sense of permanence and why modern man is fixated with the now there doesn't seem to be a continuance from one day to another and this is for me who is partly historically interested a big difference to prehistory where people had permanence that went over ages and put it into another context in the spiritual sector of today it's always now consciousness and bliss should be experienced now somehow and this is this distant not being close to it anymore the absence if it's not there there will be no presence and in a way these are contradictions but in another way the world itself is made of contradictions without those there will be no permanent and impermanent existence there will be no will literally no will Deacon is pointing to a way of being in the world so to speak where you have no will where you have no permanence and it would be impossible for you even to imagine permanence I think that rings a bell very clearly and I think there could be a reason why people give up thinking deeply about these things because it feels futile and they strive without ever getting to it for either the impermanence or the permanence it would elude them it would be like trying to catch a cloud every time they grasp for it it disappears through their fingers but let the cloud be and it's massive it's strong it will both yield and persist and of course in futuro is an impossibility in ordinary thinking and therefore it is an absolute no-no within biology I was thinking of Stephen Jay Gould who touched on these subjects and he was so immensely scolded for that so he had to make a 
renunciation of his <laughs> heretical thoughts. Who was called That is Stephen J. Gold. But Stephen J. Gold had to give up and so did Popper. And I think for our time it's becoming more and more idiosyncratic to give up all all thinking of permanence. It doesn't exist for us. No one seemed to be able to think in way of permanence. And I think this is important to realize that thinking itself doesn't have the ability to produce the thinking of permanence. It's very, very important. We are very sloppy about this. We say, well, I can think permanence. I can think continuous. No, you cannot. You will not be able if you grasp for an existent permanence. If you would look, got sort of locked into a logocentric strand. See, I end with that question. Thank you as a presenting this paper by D. Conan Cashman. I have always struggled to understand good Yodel. But today, this illustration with page numbers helped me. <clears throat> and I, I figured out uh, perhaps an uh, even simpler way to understand the page analogy. Uh, if you take a book, a whatever book, um, the very first page of a new chapter, every new chapter, um, Usually, the editors don't put, it, put out the page number, as you know. And, uh, so the page number is lacking in, uh, for instance, in, in every new chapter. And that made me think that uh, this perhaps a help with, uh, that could help to uh, that could help understand what Cashman and uh, Deacon and uh, Kurt Gödel too, because the point with Deacon and Cashman is that absence. Uh, has a great role. So although the page number is not there, we, we is almost more important this page number that is absent because um, the first page of a chapter is that uh, uh, that is hmm, which reels, uh, which plays uh, which shows the develop development in the chapter. Um, what do you think, Haas? Could that be a way of understanding? Could you, did I simplify too much? Perhaps. <clears throat> yeah, I recommend that you put some. Uh, uh, the hap this page example is extraordinary good. And uh, by putting some uh, work to it, it will finally yield. Uh, I read the book, Gerd Lescherbach, and it is tough. It's a tough read for obvious reasons. Why? Well, we wouldn't be caught up in this if it was easy to escape. This is the reason. This is the only reason. It cannot be explained simply, but it's in a way it's not complicated. We need to remember, it's almost like this, we need to remember what was said in the beginning that the pages depicted the other numbers and by focusing and expanding our attention, keeping the attention, I would say long enough then the problem become obvious. 
but if attention is short, once you read, uh, so to reach the conclusion, the beginning of your uh, of the sentence will be gone in your thinking. So this is how I perceive it. This is my trick, so to speak. But I'm I'm sure this is the reason why. Uh, it's so hard to understand. You need to expand the thinking to keep what is in the beginning when you reach the end. Because this makes the Principia Mathematica impossible. It needs to be expanded. This uh, was for me very helpful uh, making more into thinking so you can keep the whole sentence but we can have a training day on it i think it's so interesting uh, so i will devote uh, thanks for the idea Kalle, a whole lecture to the girdle escher bach and give some hints how it can be read carefully so you can get it so to speak but you can never ever jump to the conclusion because for there to be a conclusion, the beginning needs to be still with you. In that way, it's not similar to syllogism, where you have two propositions and you have a sort of an answer. You, you, can, you can, can be enough with the answer. But in this case, not. It is in detail different. And Oddly enough, this is exactly what Gurley is saying. It's exactly that he's saying. And for every time you go through it, it becomes a little bit clearer. It's, trust me, it is incredibly interesting as well. It's revealing. Because it reveals how thinking is. And how it shouldn't be. Because we do think like Principia Mathematica, and we do think like the logical positivists. Because it's cut out thinking. It is not the whole expanded. Uh, I wish everyone a very good night and have pleasant dreams. Bye bye for now. <clears throat>